Do you sense something a little different? Yeah. yeah, well, it is a little different. It's hot in here. Seriously? That's not the different I was talking about. Now, the Lord changed something up this morning. We're going right into the preaching right away. And then we, we're not stopping with the worship. We're going to have communion and do the worship afterwards. It was funny because I was with the Lord this morning, and of course, it, it, it was so weird. You know, I went to bed effectively at 9 p.m. because of the time change, and all throughout the night, I'm just thinking, man, I have so much time, and I kept waking up and thinking, man, I'm just not even tired, and so I get up at, at I think it was six, or woke up at six, started messing with my phone, got down, and like the Lord spoke to me immediately. It was, it was strange, because normally, you know, I'm, I'm in worship, I'm seeking him and everything else, and it was almost like he couldn't wait to get it out of his mouth. And, and so this morning, I, w- I was sitting with the men in, in men's class, and, and, and I said, Lord, I, I'm just so excited. I'm so excited to share this this morning, and, and, and really, it's an epiphany in his word. That's what excites me. It's like when things in his word that for 35 years I've not fully understood, and then all of a sudden, and I understand them. That gets me excited. And so I was excited this morning to share, and, and he, said, he said, well, why do you need to wait? I said, what do you mean? He said, why don't you get up there first, and then we'll worship after. And he said, their worship will be exciting. So that's what I'm doing up here now. It's not because I have a meeting. It's not because I want to leave. It's because I literally could not wait to get up here. So we're going to open in prayer and then just share whatever the Lord has. Father, we worship you, we praise you, we love you, God. We say yes to you. We say yes to your will. We say yes to your word. We say yes to your son. We say yes to your Holy Spirit. We just say yes, Lord. Without any parameters, Father, I declare for Ignition Church, we say yes, your will be done. And Father, that's what I ask this morning, that your will be done. That whatever you desire to speak, you speak. I give you my mouth, I give you my hands, my feet, I give you my mind, my will. Take every piece of me, for it was bought with a price and it is not mine anyway. Use it according to what you want, what you desire, Lord. We invite your Holy Spirit to permeate this place. For he is our partner in opening scripture to be able to understand, to literally have ears to hear and eyes to see. We cannot do that without him. Help us to perceive what the Spirit, capital S, Holy Spirit, says to the churches. Open the layers of your word Make it profound because there is nothing that comes out of your mouth that is not. We stand in awe of you, God. We stand in awe of you, Jesus, the Son of God who by choice became a man, inserted himself into his own creation because there was 
by no other that the payment could be made. And he lived a sinless life. Even though he was tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. Then he gave that perfect life. Jesus, you gave that perfect life for us, for your children, for your creation. You gave it to reverse what had been taken, although freely given, through deception by Adam. And you did pay for it. You paid for it with your blood. You would paid for it by being the perfect sacrifice. But because of that perfection, because of that sinlessness, death had no hold on you. It had no authority over you. What you gave in your life did not give authority to death. In fact, it defeated death. What you gave brought an end to that death authority. You rose from the grave. You spent 40 days being seen by people on this earth. So there would be a record, a recognition of what you had done, of who you were, that you were among the first, you were the first of, re of the resurrection. A resurrection that you have promised for all, all those who would follow you. All those who would believe. And then you were taken up. You were taken up, sat at the right hand of your Father, who is now our Father, as his adopted children. And the Father said, Sit here until your enemies become your footstool. So Jesus, you are our leader. You are the Lord of hosts, the Lord of heaven's armies. You guide us who are your hands and your feet. This is how you intended it for Israel, but they would not believe. So because of their disbelief, it opened it up to any who would believe and who would receive you as Savior, as Master. I thank you for that. That did not negate Israel. In fact, it is the very peace that will make them jealous. Your love has never kindled or has never drawn out for your children, Israel. It's never died. It's never drawn down. It's never even slowed. In fact, what you're doing right now in the bride to make Israel jealous is still for your chosen people. Every promise that you have made will be fulfilled to them. I declare it in Jesus' name. So speak to us this morning. We love you desperately. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Facebook, are you ready to shut me off? Can I get something off my chest? 
all this crap about whose side is right. Israel, Palestine, this person, that person, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Who cares? Who cares? Because when you get down into the weeds of the feelings, you can justify anything. Hitler did. He justified the genocide of six million Jews. By the way, that's nothing compared to the Catholic Church. Do you know there is one entity greater than any in all of the world's history in killing Christians? And it's Christians or those that call themselves Christians. The Catholic Church has killed more Christians than anyone else. So don't tell me to get into the weeds of feeling. See, here's the problem. I know in Gaza there are Christians. There are people that know Jesus Christ as Savior. There are people in Israel that are the same. By the way, there are people in Iran that are the same. It's not about that. This whole situation's real simple. Real simple. And you have to look at it this way. God set aside the land for them. Period. It was always their place to take it. That's what happened when Joshua came on after Moses, right? He went in and took the land. But even then, he only took a portion. And they left the very remnant that the Lord said would become a thorn in their side. So this question isn't about occupation of Israel and Gaza or about this and that, it is about land. In Deuteronomy, I believe, or I'm, I'm sorry, in Genesis chapter 11, I believe it is, at the Tower of Babel, when God, according to Deuteronomy 32, gave away the nations, he then, 200 years later, began to build a remnant for himself with Abraham. Just 200 years after the Tower of Babel. In that beginning to build a remnant for himself, we know the story. We know how God promised an heir. Abraham and Sarah got antsy and didn't believe. Well, they believed, but they thought, well, maybe we're supposed to take this into our own hands and Okay, here's Hagar, and okay, now God says, well, guess what? Now you're going to be the father of many nations. He made promises to Ishmael, well, really to Ishmael's mom, Hagar, as he did to Abraham or to Isaac. But they're different promises. There was a promise made to Abraham. And I want to read it. This is, re remember, the whole Old Testament, really much of the New even, but the whole Old Testament is written from the perspective of Israel. Okay? You don't, you don't pop into the Old Testament and see how how you know, the, the ancient Chinese did, or the Aztecs down in South America, you, you, you don't read that in there. It's written from the perspective all the way back through ancient Mesopotamia, which is where it started. And then it got separated at the Tower of Babel. And we've talked about that as to why, because of, because of their unity in sin. And, and I know I keep referring back to the, the two different seeds. If you don't understand that, please go back. I'll say it again. I probably said it three weeks in a row now.
go listen to that podcast about the two seeds because that is the foundation for everything that we are seeing today, everything. So what he said to Abraham was this, or at the point, I think it was Abram. In Genesis 15, verse 17, it says, When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoke, fire pot, and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day, on that very day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, or Abram, saying, To your offspring I give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. And then he goes on. There's so much debate, so much debate about the land of Israel. So much debate. There is not more heated discussion that goes over a small piece of land than Israel in all of history. Why? Because Satan sets his targets based on what God wants. And what God says. Do you know the original thing that he offered his son Abraham, or Abram at the time? We just read it. He gave the two parameters. I find it interesting in there that in that is included a mountain that Satan claimed as his own. And we've we've talked about that, Mount Hermon. But if you look at a map, this is really interesting to me. I don't know about you. First time it was sent to me was before I went to Jordan. Rich had sent it to me. But then, then I did study on it. And then I came to this verse and I thought, okay, I'm 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 convinced that it's even a little bit different. Because Basically, according to what Richard sent me, you've got, you've got the river, the great river in Egypt, which is what? It's the Nile, right? That's the one where Moses was hid and put down as a two-year-old boy and all that. All the way up to the great, Euphra- great river Euphrates, which is what? It's the northernmost border. It basically goes all the way from one point up in what is northern Syria, all the way down and ends at Kuwait. Okay? Now, from this, they kind of draw a triangle, okay, in, in, in this and say, this is what the Lord promised. I see it a little different than that because if you look at all the examples of how God uses geography and uses things to explain, and then look at, just look at a map, It's actually laid out real easy. If you look at a global map, just Google, I hate Google, but just Google global map or Middle East map or Africa, whatever, that area, and look at it. I think God looked at it. He gave the, the northernmost border for using a river, using a body of water, which, which is historically what's been used as a borderline, and then gave the southernmost. Guess what? There's water all around the rest of it. You've got the Persian Gulf down here. Up here, you've got the Mediterranean Sea. Everything, and then there is this one big swatch of land that was carved out For God's children that he told Abram would be innumerous, innumerable. Am I making up a word? (laughs) Not to be numbered. (laughs) If you look at a map, and this is just my personal belief, but I believe that their land included all of Basically, what we know of as the northern territories, Lebanon, uh, a lot of that half of Iraq, because the, the uh, 
the Euphrates goes through Iraq, all the way over to Kuwait, and all the way down, which includes all of Jordan. It includes many other nations that are all Arab nations. It's extraordinary to look at it. And God promised it to him. Promised it to him before Abram was even Abraham. Before he even knew anything about anything. God keeps his promises. When he had me go to Mount Nebo last year and he had me declare from Mount Nebo, one of the things that was declared was, you will receive all the land. This is declaring to Israel. You will receive all the land that was promised to you, and yet it will come by the hands of Gentiles. So, guys, the thing going on right now, it's about land. It's always been about land. It's not about people. Can we turn some of that heat off? I'm about to die here. And didn't you say you were hot? Yeah, thank you. You're sitting right in front of it. So don't get confused. Don't get into the weeds. And I'm not saying that the stories are not important. Of course they are. In fact, when I pray... And I pray for Israel, and and if you don't have a prayer strategy sheet that Wendy typed up and Wendy was before the Lord on, they're over on the table. Please grab one on how to pray. But one of the things you pray for is the people in Gaza that know the Lord. Do you not think that God can save them? Of course. Of course he can. Of course he could protect them. But that land still has to be taken for who it was originally given to. So, so God was showing me this, and, and, and I, I just thought, well, you know, Lord, I, I don't know. I know you want me to tell the people that, but that just doesn't sound like a whole sermon. <laughs> And then he said, well, you know what? Open your Bible. And he took me to Revelation chapter 3. And then he took me to Revelation chapter 2. And then he took me back to Zechariah. And my mind just started to explode. If you weren't here last week or didn't last li- listen last week, please listen. Because it was the foundation for everything that we're talking about today. What is going on in Zechariah And I'm going to have you turn there. Zechariah chapter 6. I don't want to take the time to go through last week's stuff, but please listen to it. There are four horsemen that are listed in Zechariah. Don't assume they're the same four horsemen that are in Revelation chapter 6, because they're not. Go listen last week if you you don't understand that or don't know. But I, I want to point out something here that... He was showing me because he he first took me to Revelation chapter 3. The reason why we're not going there yet is because that's the bulk of of what I want to talk about. But but he showed me two things here that I just want to share with you. We looked back at it. There are four horsemen or four horses or chariots led with horses that are sent out. And you you can, in your mind, when it talks about these these horses, it's not that, okay, this chariot sent out and go. No, they, these are vast armies. This is literally the armies of God sent out in the spirit to bring a manifestation here on earth of what is intended, okay? The first one that went out was red, and that was war. You, you see the understanding of that if you... If you go and look in Revelation 6. So war is sent out first. Then the black horse, which is basically economic disaster. The taking of wealth. Then the third one, white horses. Well, we know from Revelation that the white horse is a conqueror. 
The white horse is literally commanders that take over, okay? And then the last one is the one that's different. We talked about it last week, that dappled horse. And the dappled horse is the one that gave favor, Okay, if you look at the, and, and again, I don't mean to keep going over last week, but if you look at, at what happened with Jacob and the sheep, he kept the dappled sheep, right? The spotted sheep, and that was his portion. Is it hot? Turn on the AC, please. I'm, I'm, I'm seeing people going like this, and I know it's a struggle when it's warm. Turn it down to minus 15. <laughs> Because you guys got to get this. You got you to gotta hear this. But what he showed me this morning ties into Revelation chapter 3 because Revelation chapter 3 is literally what will manifest in this battle. Right? He sent out the red one first, which means war. You notice that war is the only one that was sent, that didn't give a description of where it was sent. Well, the dappled gray also, I think. Let's see, four wins. Yeah, the, yeah, the dappled gray as well. So, so the red horses or war is going to affect the entire world. It's going to go out to the entire world, north, south, east, west. Okay, all from, remember, the perspective of Israel. But same with the dappled. The dappled one will be all over. The benefit to the bride will be all over. But the thing that was amazing to me that the Lord showed me was the black one and the white one. The black horse... And the white horses were very specific, right? It says here, uh, let's see, what are these? My look, verse 5 of chapter 6. And the angels answered, said to me, These are going out to the four winds of heaven after presenting themselves before the Lord of all the earth. The chariot with the black horses go, goes toward the north country. The white ones go after them. And the dappled ones go toward the south. Okay. You've got the black horses going north. Now, the north in this representation is, in the spirit, is the enemy. Okay, don't, don't think, okay, well, everything north of Israel is going to be this war zone. The war zone's everywhere. The black horses, with, which represent a destruction of the economic foundation... That's not about that just happening in Lebanon, which is north of Jerusalem. It's happening all over, but it is happening to the representation of the northern armies in the spirit. Do you understand what I'm saying? You've got two. You've got in the spirit the northern armies, which are the armies that are represented by Mount Hermon. The demonic armies, and this is in the spirit. The southern armies are represented in the book by Jerusalem, which are God's armies. Okay, understand I'm trying to give you a perspective of representation in the word of God. Are you with me? Okay, so the northern armies are who? Demonic forces. Demonic forces. The southern armies armies are who? God's armies, those with God. It separates it out. Do you understand that? Who's he send north? Black and white. He sends out the economic distress. First of all, he sends war everywhere because something has to trigger this. And my goodness, if you're not seeing that war is starting to be triggered, you don't have your TV on, you're sitting in your bedroom, you're not listening to anybody or anything. Even yesterday, Russia made a public statement that they are with Iran. 
Did you guys catch that? I mean, do you know how big that is? That's huge. That's huge. The stage is being set for World War III because that's what the enemy wants. But the Lord has spoken through his prophets that the enemy will not get what he wants. Why? Because he's sending the black horses north into their camps. Their economic structure will be destroyed, followed by the white horses, which I believe represent the bride, the readied remnant bride, the one tied into relationship with Jesus Christ, the ones living for him, the ones fully devoted to him. They will conquer. They will conquer. And I, and I know, especially those online, you know, right now is about the turnoff time. Before you turn me off, remember when this happens, turn it back on, come back to this date, and listen to the rest of it. Because it will come true. It is coming true. That is what God has planned for his remnant bride. It was actually planned for the whole bride. But many in the bride won't listen. Many in the bride won't hear it. Sadly, if you read later into Revelation chapter 3, you'll understand how God deals with that in the spitting out of the lukewarm. The lukewarm are not the world. They're cold. They're non-existent before the Lord in terms of relationship. The lukewarm are those who say, I love Jesus, and yet don't live a life surrendered to him. It is all about the surrender. So recognize, I, I mean, it just, it just made chapter 6 blow up to me. What he is sending, first of all, the war goes out everywhere. But then he is sending the black horses followed by the white horses because the black horses are necessary for there to be a transitional change. I don't know why, but it seems to be that money talks on this earth. And, and by the way, it always has. Going all the way back. Solomon being, you know, the wealthiest in all of history in comparison at his time and, and even after. It was still about money. He had power. He had money. I, I'm, I'm not going to say that's necessarily how the Lord intended it. But the Lord certainly works within it. And that's what's about to change. Because what Satan has used to defy God will be changed over to those who would not use it for their own gain, but use it for what God wants. Amen. Now, I appreciate you guys clapping because it's true. But recognize the responsibility that comes with that. Recognize that that responsibility is truly being his hands and his feet. That means when you write a check, what do you do? You fill it out with your hand. I mean, most people don't write checks anymore, but okay, if you're sending money on your phone, <laughs> you do it with your hands. You know, you need to ask yourself, is, is that what God's hands would do? Is that a choice he would make? That's what being a steward of what he wants is. And, and by the way, don't get down into the weeds and think, well, you know, God doesn't want me to enjoy this or that. I just need to, you know, be like a monk and I'll just give away everything and go be quiet. That's not it. We're to be examples when, when, when God does give you things, it is to steward and to be examples of what he wants. I'm telling you this now because 
We're in that transition now. It's beginning now. You're going to see this globally. Understand chapter 6 of Zechariah because what has already happened, and by the way, this has already happened in the Spirit. I shared that last week. We've had like 58 or whatever, 57, 58 Court of Nations cases that has disassembled the enemy, disassembled, literally torn apart the enemy's hierarchy and infrastructure. That's why you're seeing how crazy things are now. You know, I think I said this last week, but what's it look like when the teacher doesn't show up to a classroom? I mean, they go nuts, right? How about, how about you have 30 second graders and nobody shows up? What do you think happens by the end of that hour? They're all doing their own thing. They're all doing their own thing with no direction from a leader. That's what's going on in the spirit realm right now. You're seeing it manifest everywhere right now. Don't be afraid of the manifestation. Good night. Thank you, Lord, for the manifestation. Because it is his intention to do it because it is from that foundation that that white horse can come out and can conquer and can take what is rightfully his children's. And and by the way, you don't have to go out and take something. The Lord's going to put it in your lap. He's going to put it in your lap. But you got to steward it. you got to know what you're to do with it. You got to know, first and foremost, you're in a war. Because, see, how, do, how, does, how does chapter 6 end? Verse 7 When the strong horses came out, they were impatient to go and, the, and patrol the earth. And man, have I felt that in this spirit. It's like, dude, do not get in their way. Do not get in God's way because there is an impatience going on now because there has been so much destruction to God's people so much indifference so much depression so much wrong done to them that these horses are like let me out let me out we've got to go and then it says Lord said, go patrol the earth. So they patrolled the earth. And then verse 8, in the spirit, this is where we're at in the hierarchy. I'm not saying it's totally done, but this is where we're at in the hierarchy in the spirit. Then he cried to me, behold, those who go toward the north country. Who's the north country again? Demonic side, the demonic spirits. Those who go toward the north country have set my spirit at rest in the north country. What do you think it means to set his spirit at rest in the demonic side? Bingo. That they're gone. That they're wiped out. They're not just controlled. You ever try and control a badger? not going to happen. See, their control comes from them being defeated and sent to the abyss. Their hierarchy, this has already happened to. But the real war is in the trenches of the billions that are out there at a low level. They have to be taken care of. That's why every single person here, every single person in the remnant body of Christ is critical because you're to be a warrior. You're to war against the spirits that are not of God. 
Don't give them rest. Send them to the abyss. Don't let them just hang out to go infect somebody else. Send them to the abyss. You have the authority to do that. Jesus Christ paid for that authority, for that very reversal 2,000 years ago. Know that. But here's the thing. You better know how to fight. Better know how to fight. And you can only do that through relationship in, with Jesus Christ. If your focus is on fighting, you're already in trouble. If your focus is relationship with him and he's telling you to go fight, that's where you need to be. That's where you gotta be. Because he's the one who equips you. He's the one who literally does everything. You just do the motions. You just speak the declarations. And he does it. So in the spirit, much of this has already happened. Now his, his spirit isn't at peace that it's all done because there's a manifestational part of it that has to happen for it all to be done. It's not two worlds, guys. You don't have the spirit realm and the physical realm and they're just two different things and I'm going to just choose to live in this one. No, it's two halves of a whole. What happens in the spirit first will always manifest in the physical. So what has already happened in those 58 court cases is, has, and will continue to manifest. We'll see it before our eyes. That's why we have to be ready to react in whatever the Lord wants us to. Each of you will be privy to a battle that nobody else is. And God will be expecting you to pray into it. You to stand in it. Because the results of it are critical to the battle. They're critical to it. And we don't have to be afraid of it. We do have to step forward in it and not worry about the physical peace. Let's go to Revelation chapter 3. When he took me here this morning, I'm, I'm familiar, you're all familiar with, with uh, these, these things here. I'm going to speak specifically, he took me to the Church of Philadelphia, and then he took me one other place, but that's where I want to start. Everybody wants to be in the Church of Philadelphia. You know, they, they are the ones that, you know, boy, in all the seven of these churches, God sure loved them, right? Well, in reality, in the bride today, all seven churches are manifest, that's why he didn't just write it to the churches at the time. He wrote it to us. That's what he means when he says those who would have ears to hear, those who are given the capability through the Spirit of what the Spirit says. Says it that at the end of each one. But let's just read through this real quick. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, the words of the Holy One, the true one, who has the key of David. What does that mean? He has the authority of all of it. And this is Revelation chapter 3, verse 7. Who has the key of David. In other words, he has the rights to the throne. Talking about Jesus Christ. We know back in chapter 1, Jesus is the one who actually penned these letters. Or, or who actually wrote these letters. Penned by John, but the words were from Jesus. Not from an angel, not from anybody else. They were from Jesus. Who has the key of David, who opens, uh, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. In other words, what he says is, verse 8, I know your works, talking about this segment of the, and don't think, think of this as a physical church, it was, but think of this 
as a segment of the bride today. In fact, I believe this is specifically the remnant bride. I think there are two letters that deal with the remnant bride. And this is the first. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come down and come, come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of the trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. I am, I am coming soon. Hold fast to what you have so that no one may seize your crown. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven and my own new name. By the way, if you, know, if you want to know where it talks about that, it's Revelation, I think, 21. 20 or 21, toward the end of the book, where the new Jerusalem comes down and it's time for God to dwell with man. Verse 13, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So recognize what God is saying here. He said, I know you guys have no power. With everything going on, with all the, the advantage that the enemy has, you have little power to fight on a global scale, if you will. You have, you have every, every power to fight in your own life. And that's not what it's talking about. It's talking about the conquering for Jesus Christ of the world. You have little power to do it. In fact, you have, you have almost no power at all, and yet you have stayed faithful. You have stayed trusting. Trusting him, building relationship with him. And he said, because of that, I'm going to make, and, and Jesus said this, I'm going to make your enemies, those who say they are like you, but really aren't. I'm going to make them bow at your feet and recognize that I love you. Let that sink in for a second. This is not just something that's going to happen in heaven. That's what you got to get. This is a physical, real life, real world scenario. It has to be for the readying of the bride. For the bride to come in rulership where Jesus Christ, seventh trumpet talks about this, where he rules the earth through his bride. It has to be physical. It can't just be that we're all sitting in a room somewhere and in the spirit we're together. Oh, I'm ruling now. Thank you, Lord. That's not it. That's not going to prove anything to Satan. You know what proves something to Satan? Beat the crap out of him. Beat the crap out of his children. Beat the crap out of his followers. And I'm not talking about going beating somebody up. I'm talking about in the spirit. You go after him in the spirit. You don't back down. And your authority is based on your surrender in your life, the purity in your life. That's what makes your sword effective. What is your sword? The word of God. The word of God coupled through a surrendered life. Man, what that does and, it, what it, and what it will do. 
So I thought it was interesting. It said, to those who conquer, verse 12, I'll make them a pillar. But right before that, and, and, and by the way, what do you think that means? This is the Lord, see, I used to read this, and I used to keep thinking future, future, future. This is in the Spirit. This is when I'm in heaven, and I'll be a pillar if I do this, and blah, blah, blah. Thank you, Lord, for opening my eyes. Because, yes, it, it may mean something in the Spirit, absolutely, no doubt. But it means something here on this earth. That's why I tell you here at Ignition, if you're here at this time, you're called for a purpose, and that purpose is leadership. That's why many have not been able to stay. Because they weren't willing to give up what was necessary for that surrender. It's because Jesus' intention in the building of the bride and the readying of the bride is that there will be leaders in the bride. Leaders are part of a foundation. That's what a pillar is. A pillar is a foundational structure that holds other things up. That's what he's building in each of you, if you let him. That's what he's building throughout the readied bride, the remnant bride, if you let him. This is what he wants to manifest here on earth now. You know, he says, hold fast, back in verse 11, hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. And he's talking about the crown of life which that took me to chapter 2. Turn to verse 8 of chapter 2. This is the letter to the church in Smyrna. Because this was the other letter. First of all, it's interesting. There, there are two things about both of these letters that are identical. One talks about those of the synagogue of Satan that say they are Jews and are not. So it, it, it talks about those who want to claim that they follow Jesus Christ or a deity or, or whatever. They, they want to say they're a Christian, but they're really not. Okay? There are only two of the seven letters that have that. And it's these two. It, it was the, to the Church of Philadelphia and to the Church of Smyrna. I find it interesting that we live between those two towns. Isn't that kind of cool? That's kind of cool. I, not that that means anything, it really does. And we have Smyrna to our south and Philadelphia to our north, but whatever. I just thought that was kind of cool. Just thought I'd throw that out there. But <clears throat> the other thing that's interesting about this, this letter, and there's only two letters that have this, where nothing was found wrong in them. If you look at all the other five, it says, but I have this against you. Or I have this problem that you have. If you would just do this. These two don't. I'm telling you, these two letters are speaking to the remnant bride right now. So let's start with verse 8. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, the words of the first and the last who died and came to life. Verse 9, I know your tribulation and your poverty. But guess what? You're rich. How often do we say that? If you have Jesus Christ, you have everything. It doesn't matter materially what you have. You have everything. It says, but you are rich. And the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan, do not fear what you are about to suffer. And right there, you just want to close it up and pretend you didn't read that. Guess what? If the red horse is going out all over the world, that red horse is going to hit our area. That red horse is going to hit every area. War is going to break out everywhere. Why? Because war has already been going on in the spirit everywhere. Everywhere. So don't be afraid of it. Do not fear what you're about to suffer. 
Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and for ten days you will have tribulation. Now please understand that God is not saying here that this is going to last for ten days. Everything's going to be good on that 11th day. So, okay, tomorrow starts the 10th day. Man, can't wait. Two weeks from now, I'm going to be good. It's not about that. There's a metaphor of 10 being a complete revolution. What God is saying here is that he is going to complete his task in this warfare. He is going to go through and complete what he intended from the beginning. He will not stop short. He will do it all. And and he says, what what you see going on around you, it's like the children of Israel. Man, when, when you start to see all this stuff happening to Egypt and everything, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. It may be dark there, but there'll be light in Goshen. Don't be afraid. And that's what he's saying here is don't be afraid. For 10 days you will have tribulation, but faithful, or he said, be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Now, by the way, to be clear, he's not saying all of you are going to die. And then you get life. It's not what he's saying. He said, don't be afraid to die. Don't be afraid to die. Are you willing to be in that army that is not afraid to die? That will give everything in the cause for Christ that he wants you to give? Don't be afraid to die. There's a very special crown set aside for those who aren't afraid to die. But you know what? It's bigger than that. It's bigger than that. But I do want to go just real quick, because it said here, you'll receive the crown of life, which I think goes with the other letter, right, about having no power and moving forward, and you receive this. If, If you are faithful in this thing, then you'll receive this crown. But I want you to turn to James. James chapter 1 verse 12 says this. It it explains more the crown of life. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Okay, so the crown of life is not a martyr's crown, necessarily. It doesn't mean you have to die to get it means you have to be willing to give everything. And for that, it means being steadfast in the trial. We just read that. It said, blessed in the man is the man who remains steadfast under trial. What does that mean? When you're going through something, You know in your heart what the answer is. You know in your heart what God has told you to do. Remaining steadfast means you're not changing and flowing with the wind. Well, you know, there's a lot of people saying, you know, Palestine really kind of has a, you know, they they have a good argument here. I mean, they're, they're living there. They're under kind of oppression because they're occupied and and all this. And, you know, I I guess I could see that. Or another one, this is a big one now. Well, you know, the Muslims kind of worship the same God we do. You know, we've had big name preachers say that. You know, it's funny because the Lord told me a couple of weeks ago, he said, I need you to do something for me because it's going to reveal more of the enemy. I said, what's that? And he said, I want you to read the Quran. What? So I did. And I, I'm not quite done. I'm almost done with it. But the thing that blows me away is it sounds so much like the word of God. Before grace. 
And that's what I, I I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole, but that's, maybe I will sometime. I'm telling you what, Muslims are going to come to know the Lord in droves, in droves. Because see, even though it is a lie in the Quran as far as who Father God is, and again, I won't go down that road, that's who they think they're worshiping. That's who they believe they're worshiping. I just have one question for the Muslims that might listen to this. First of all, Muslims do not believe in a trinity. They don't believe Jesus is God. They, they believe in a Holy Spirit, but it is not part of the trinity. God is a single God, one only, that's it. Father God, they call him Allah, which means God. But they believe he is creator God, right? They, they do not believe in any, anything else. They believe Jesus is a prophet. They believe, and there's some conjecture on this. I've seen a few different ways. Some believe that there is a Holy Spirit that's, that's kind of sent for different things. Others believe, you know, it's, it's, it's always done in a messenger way. Many Muslims believe that the Holy Spirit is Gabriel, the, the angel Gabriel. So with all of this, with, with being one single creator God, one only, answer me one question, Muslim. Why throughout the Quran does he call himself we? Always. Throughout the whole thing. He says, we did this. We did that. Now, knowing what we know about who Allah was, right? And I, I shared that a few weeks ago about being Baal. Man, I'm getting off track. <laughs> the, the we is the old council of God that is being replaced. That's who we is. He actually wasn't lying. He just wasn't talking about Father God. He was talking about the council. And, and I know that probably raised 100 million questions, but that I, didn't, I didn't mean to go off into that. Just, just Muslim, answer that question. If there is no trinity, please tell me who the we is. And, and, and it's not just uh, verbiage like what I've read. It's not just, well, that's just a colloquialism. and all. It, no, that's not. So back to what we were saying, this, this crown of life we get by remaining steadfast in the trial. When we have something hit us, what has to remain steadfast? First and foremost, our faith. Our choice to believe. Because that's what a trial does. A trial tests your ability to believe. And you ever notice that when you get so ingrained in your paradigms that you believe something, when a trial comes, it's really not that hard. If I were to do my best to try and convince you that Jesus wasn't real, I mean, that wouldn't even be an issue for you. It'd be, yeah, you know what, we're going to go somewhere else now. <laughs> you know, you would have no problem believing that. Uh, no problem not believing that. Why? Because you have solidified that by paradigm in your faith. Satan can't even touch it. That's where everything else needs to be. For what you're called to, he wants that paradigm to be so solid that when Satan comes and says, yeah, he didn't really say that to you. Your response should be so solid in that faith to say, get thee behind me, Satan. That is what it means to stay strong in that battle and receive that crown of life. I want to say one last thing about this, and then, Alexis, I'm going to have you come up. and, and uh, Well, we're going to close, but I, uh, that's when I want to do communion, and we're going to worship. But I want to say one more thing. Turn to Revelation chapter 12. 
This is the time in which we live. We are living in the time of the seventh trumpet. I won't get into that today. Man, go study that. The seventh trumpet, guys, has nothing to do with Israel in the book of Revelation. Look at it. Just read it. It doesn't. It has nothing to do with them, except for the fact that it is to make them jealous. We're living in that time. And the Lord said, remember what was asked before, what is going to make this battle, what is going to make the Lord's spirit settle in the north, right? In that spirit realm. It's the elimination of the enemy, right? The elimination of the enemy and all of his capabilities, if you will. Well, it explains in Revelation 12 how that happens. Verse 11. And they, con- they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb, which was given for us on the cross, and by the word of their testimony. They weren't afraid to step onto the battlefield. And they loved not their lives even unto death. Just because you go to war doesn't mean that you're going to die. But it means that you're going to fight no matter what. It's no different in the spirit. It's no different. We go to war until there is no more enemy to go to war over. And if you don't believe that that's going to happen, then you really need to sit with some of these chapters. You really need to sit with Zechariah chapter 6 and understand what's going on. Don't assume that, well, everything's just kind of in the spirit realm. Nothing happens in the spirit realm that does not manifest in the physical. It's just the truth of it. Because everything comes by faith. And so, he wants us to be geared up for what's going on. See things for what they are. The enemy, things are chaotic right now. Why? Because the enemy is starting to show their hand. There's two things happening. The enemy is showing their hand because they can't help it. They can't help it. But then there are followers of them that can help it that just think maybe they should go along. Man, that's probably how most of the college students are right now. I think if you were to ask half those college, you know, the college protests, what they were really protesting, I bet you half the kids there wouldn't even know what they're talking about. Well, I came because Johnny came and I think he's really cute. (laughs) Or whatever. You know, but there is a passion that's leading it. That's who you need to focus on. That's where you need to have your discernment. Because again, if you don't know the foundation of this, go back to the podcast of the two seeds. I think that's what it's called. Something about two seeds. You can look it up that way. It was right out of of Genesis chapter 3, one of the first prophecies ever spoken God said, your seed, the seed of the woman, will be at enmity or hatred with the seed of the enemy, the seed of Satan. I asked the Lord one time, and and in in that, that message, it's talking about the same seed that built up in Genesis 6 is building up now. There are Nephilim on the earth now. There are non, there are unredeemable people, if you will, and I just lost all the rest of the churches, in the earth right now, just like in Genesis 6. The same. And, and I remember the Lord told me part of my job in the spirit was to be a hunter, to hunt them, 
in the spirit. In the spirit. I want to make that clear. I don't need any visitations. So I asked the Lord, how can I tell? How can I tell who they are? And this was probably, I don't know, four or five months ago or, oh no, no. Was that this year, Bren, that you sent that? So it was, it was on my birthday, literally May 11th of this past year that I asked the Lord this and, and that's, this is what he said to me. Asking him, how, how will I know or how will we know who they are? And Jesus said, well, here, I'll read my question first. One of the questions I really wished I had asked, because we had just had Satan on the stand, and that was like my opportunity to ask all kinds of questions. And then I, we were with the Lord, and I said, one, one question I really wish I would have asked him, but I didn't. I said, but maybe it's a question he can't even answer. How do we distinguish his seed here on earth? Especially for those who you will command death through. And this is what the Father said. Some will manifest physically, but most can only be shown. From that point, we have seen manifestation. We have seen people that were considered moderate because they were quiet, that cannot stop from speaking that cannot stop themselves from speaking hate and lies. I'm not saying that that's who they are. I'm saying that that is a tell. Recognize that that's going to happen. Don't get discouraged when you hear on the TV and all you hear is, man, everybody hates Israel now. I mean, Israel's being surrounded by all these nations and, and America isn't even supporting them. Now, I, I know I said a couple of weeks ago, maybe it's because America won't be able to because we're dealing with our own thing. Who knows? Maybe America won't support them. Shame on us if that's the case. But the whole point is nobody will. Whether they're not able to or whether they choose not to, nobody will. Because this still boils down to Satan hating God's plan for his chosen nation, the very one that was held back from Lucifer himself. That's Israel. Do you find it interesting that everything wraps around Israel even right now? Even in the readying of the bride, it all wraps around Israel. This peace that is being taken from the earth, it's, it's not because America, you know, got hit in New York again and, you know, the new tower came down or, or you know, somebody blew up the, the Capitol in Washington, D.C. Half the world would cheer. But with Israel, nobody sits on the sideline. Nobody. It's funny how you see that develop. They're on one side or another. You're starting to see it manifest more and more. So don't be afraid of it. Don't be afraid of what God is doing in his movement here. Rejoice in it. Be solid in your relationship with him and he'll show you your peace. What his will is for your life and don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to step. Don't be afraid to pray bold prayers. And, and by the way, I'm not talking about, I, I know so many pastors say that and you think, well, you know, praying for riches or praying for things, you know, give me this so then I can help this. And don't do that. He's not going to give you that if you haven't already stewarded the authority that you have. You have the authority right now to be praying against Israel's enemies. You have the authority to be praying in the Spirit against those who come against God. So do it. Do it. Be active in it. Don't just say, well, you know, I'm just kind of waiting. And, you know, if, Lord, if you bless me, then I could send, you know, I could send money to all those people that need things in Israel. And, and that's how, 
No. No, do what you can with what you have, and when you steward that right, he will give you more because he could trust you. But get involved. Get involved in this fight. At this point, 98% of the fight is in prayer anyways. I mean, we're not in Israel. You know, I mean, unless you want to go down to D.C. and march or whatever you want to do. Right now, it's not a phys- physical fight for us, especially, especially if you live, you know, kind of in the suburbs like us. If you turned your TV off and turned all your social media off, you probably wouldn't even know anything's going on. But in the spirit, there's a war. Get engaged. Fight. And then he'll give you more to fight with. Let's pray. Father, we worship you and we praise you and we love you, Lord. We thank you, God. And Father, I just pray over each one here and each one who walks, watches online that you give eyes to see and ears to hear that which your Spirit is saying. Not that people would believe me, but they would see what you are saying. We trust you, Lord. Use us in any way you see fit. Again, I speak for ignition's sake. We, we will step where you want us to step. We are not afraid. I am not afraid. I know others here are not afraid. Teach us how to be effective in you. We love you and thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to have communion and and go into worship. Some of our schedule is a little bit different today, but I hope and pray that, um, and maybe it doesn't even apply to those here in this room, but you really, we really do have to believe in the reality of the spirit realm to even grasp some of the references to the court cases and things like that. Um, with, or he, he said a couple of things that were very significant in that um, you can't just choose to live in one world or the other. You really have to understand that you are impacted every single day in every single area of your life from the spirit realm, whether you choose to believe that or not. And there's a lot of different verbiages out there. There's different languages and even redefining of words to cause people to have a different lens on it. But when you can grasp the reality of the spirit, we are spirit beings. And when Jesus was ministering to the woman at the well, what did he say? He said he's looking for true worshipers, those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. And the only way you can truly worship him is in the spirit. There can be outward religious ceremonies you can participate in, but true worship is a surrendered heart that first receives the Lord Jesus as Savior And then lays everything down of ourselves and says, not my will, but thine be done. That heart posture of worship. See, the Lord looks on the heart, not on the outward appearance. Many people that are even this morning in whatever time zone they're in, all across the world that may be participating in churches or maybe are at home in their living room looking at something online and they're going through maybe some ritual or some um, repeat after me process, that if they're not worshiping in their heart, God sees the truth. See, in the spirit realm, it's all revealed. It's all exposed. You cannot hide or put any airs on. Well, you know, the enemy sees that as well. And the greatest power against the enemy starts, A, with accepting Jesus, but then B, with believing him and knowing who he is, and then in knowing who he is, discovering who we are in him. 
The Lord gave me a little assignment this past week, and I really recommend you doing it. Even though I know it, he wants me to do it so that I can memorize it, so that it just flies out whenever he desires it to. And that is all of the things, all of, the, all of what I am in him, who I am in him, and then scriptures that go with it. So that basically, whether it be declaring privately over particular oppression, whether it being answering and being ready and willing to give an answer when someone asks, he just wants me to know who I am. I tell you, I really recommend that you go into the word deeply and find out who you are because readying yourself, you know, when you look at sometimes this global lens that, that the Lord gave Greg to, to let us see the times in which we're living, sometimes you have to pull it back to, okay, well, what is my peace, like he just said? Well, it starts with being on your face before the Lord and saying, Lord, what would you have of me? That laid down life, that purity and that worship and that faith stance is such a threat to the enemy. When it just starts there and then you link arms with someone else that is in that same heart posture, there is nothing that can stop someone in that position by all the forces of hell itself. Why? Because of 1 John 4.4, 4, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Greater, the very same Holy Spirit within us raised Jesus from the dead. And I hope I got that reference correct. But we have the power, like Greg said earlier, we have the power in our own lives. We have not been given the epi upon power yet to fight in the next level of what is coming. But in your own personal life, you can take ground wherever God sends you based on the Holy Spirit's power within you. When A, you're in purity with him so that the enemy doesn't have any legal document in the courts. Don't get hung up on that verbiage. Anybody listening online, don't get caught up on the courts if you've never heard that term. And oh, that ignition didn't make that up. It's in the word. It is the lens through which the entire ways of God operate. You'll see if you look at the word of God, if you look at the ways of God, the character of God, through a judicial lens, you will get to see he is the righteous judge. Yes, he is also our father. But he judges, he rules. And now as joint heirs with Jesus, he's raising us to judge, to rule in subduing the earth and in taking ground. And so first when there's purity, but then when there is a listening to the Holy Spirit as to what to take in a particular situation, take authority over, to bind. Um, it's, it's in a really powerful place. And sometimes, one of my favorite songs, and it's not the one we're going to listen to in, in a moment, because we're going to listen to a song and just prepare our hearts for communion. The Lord didn't give me a particular communion message, and I take communion very seriously, that it never become robotic or religious or tradition, um, I really just, whatever the Holy Spirit has me say for a communion, um, it, it is so sacred that to, to put anything religious on it would be to negate everything. But the one thing that he did say is that um, we are, the favorite song, let me mention that first. The favorite song that I love is Defender. And it's because sometimes all you can do is worship. All you can do is just lay down and let him defend and fight for you. When you don't know what to do, start with purity, confession of sin. Search me, O oh God. Know me. Try me. See if there's any wicked way in me. And I give it to you. Be willing to confess your sin. If you are holding on to anything in an offense to God, in something that's not right with God, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. If you're holding a sin and you will not relinquish it, you're not in a place where communion is to be taken. You take communion in purity. But you know, that used to, when I was a kid, and I learned that principle, I thought, okay, how can I ever take communion? But the Lord says, confess your sin. He's, I'm faithful, I'm just, to forgive you immediately. So when you're worshiping, 
Ask him, say, Lord, if there's anything, bring it to my mind right now. And I'm just, I, I, ask, I, I just ask forgiveness. Now, if you don't want to give that up, then that's something you have got to work out with the Lord. If there's something you'd rather have than pure fellowship with the Lord, I, I pray that he will work deeply in your heart to cause you to lay that down. Because I would say that if you're holding on to anything, any excuse, any justification, how's that working out for you? How much success are you having in fighting the enemy when he is allowed legal documents against your life because of things that you're holding on? Because again, you, you may think you're hiding it from humans and you may be hiding it from every human, but you can't hide it in the spirit realm from God or from the enemy when it comes to um, a sin issue. And that's why the accuser of the brethren is constantly before one of the courts, the court of accusation, to bring evidence against you, but he has nothing to use against you when you just lay it down. So prepare your heart and then worship. What a weapon against the enemy. Worship him. And that's why I love that song, Defender, because um, sometimes he just says, look, just give my, my, your entire focus to me and me alone and then watch what I do to your enemy. Um, it's really amazing. So I want to we're actually going to play a different song that is, uh, it's called High and Lifted Up. And I want you to listen to the words of this song. It is such an acknowledgement of all of the realms and all of the levels of authorities that exist that Ephesians 6.12 talks about. All of the gods. Yes, there are other gods. That might sound like heresy. But if it is, then why is that? Why did God not put it, or he put in the, one of the commandments, thou shalt have no other God before me? It's because there are other gods. There is just only one true God, the God, King of kings, Lord of lords, Elohim creator God. There is nothing higher. But obviously there are other gods that are, that are not the God, and that's why it was one of the commandments that was given. And this, is, this song acknowledge him, acknowledges God. He is high and lifted up. He's higher than anything in all of the realms of the spirit and the physical realm. He is to be acknowledged, worshipped. And man, when you get your heart in that place, recognizing who he is, and then you can grasp that what Jesus came and gave of himself Inserting himself into, as Greg prayed in the opening prayer, inserting himself into the human realm of creation and gave the sacrifice, reversing what Adam gave away. And we can then recognize what he paid for us to, through our faith, have every spiritual blessing, Ephesians says, is ours. When you begin to grasp these things, the enemy becomes very, very small in your life. And he also isn't really able to hide anymore. Whatever it is, infirmity, whatever they want to call it, you know, trials, things that are called mental illness, you, can, you begin to discern and the Lord will lift the veil off of your eyes and show you things for what they are because you're now recognizing what authority you have in Christ Jesus to take the ground from that place and bring it back to the Lord's. That is why worship is so important. And communion is a place of acknowledging and grateful acknowledgement of what Jesus gave. It is so precious. It just, as soon as my, my mind connects with my spirit at the real realization of what Jesus did for me, it weakens me into an emotional place because I'm like, this is so massive. It's the key to everything. Don't ever go through a communion like it's just the thing we do at the beginning of the month or whatever. See it as the power source given as a gift in the love that, that not only is what God gives but is who he is that was bestowed upon us, even in our sin, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ loved and died for us by his grace. So I want you to just soak in that during this song 
And then we'll be, we're going to, at the end of the song, John, will be passing out the communion cups, and the worship team will come up and just play, and we'll take communion together. All right. Go ahead. under your name Every other throne is under your throne Every other kingdom is under your kingdom You are high and lifted under your power every other glory is under your glory every other spirit is under your spirit you are high and lifted up yeah. You are 
We praise you, God. We praise you. As the communion cups are being passed, God, we acknowledge you. We praise you, God. I come to you now in the name of Jesus and give you praise, God. I worship you, God, for who you are. I bless your holy name. You are worthy. You are mighty. You are awesome in power. You are our champion enthroned. I praise the name of Jesus. You are worthy of all the praise, all the honor, all the glory. God, thank you. You are the great and mighty God, King of kings, Lord of lords. Your name is higher. Jesus, at your name, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. God, we honor your name. We worship you. Thank you, mighty Redeemer, Restorer, Defender. God, you are the stronghold of our faith. God, you are love, hope, help. Thank you that you are truth. Jesus, you said you are the way, the truth, and life itself. Thank you for the truth that you will never leave us or forsake us. That nothing, nothing can ever separate us from your love, God. Thank you that we are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. Thank you that our weapons of our warfare are not human, not carnal, but they are mighty through Christ Jesus to the tearing down of strongholds. Thank you, God. Thank you for your promises. Thank you for everything that you bestow upon your children. Thank you that there is nothing too hard for you, God. Nothing will be impossible for you. Thank you that if you are for us, who can be against us? Thank you, Jesus, that you forgive us of our sins when we ask your faithful, your just to forgive us. God, I praise you. I praise you that you work all things together for good to those that love you and are called according to your name and your word and your plan. Thank you, Jesus, for the cross. Thank you for the blood that purged us from our sins. Thank you that you so loved the world that whosoever believes in you will not perish but have everlasting life. Thank you for these beautiful promises. Thank you for your written word that shows your character, shows who you are, shows your ways. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for the rhema word that, that goes deeper to the inexhaustible places of your Logos word that, that we can learn more and more of who you are for right now, right here, right in this place, right in this time to know what you're doing, to know who we are, and to know what we're called to, that there is only hope and joy, God, that you're only doing things to bring yourself glory. Let us be giving you the glory now in our worship and in our praise. God, I thank you. I thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you, Jesus, for the sacrifice that allowed us access to you, to even speak these words knowing we're before the throne of God as we're in agreement with what is being prayed to you right now. We're lifting our hearts in unity. Thank you for access behind the veil because of what Jesus did. The veil was torn. It is finished. We are victorious in Christ Jesus. How can we not worship you for that? It is so mighty. It is so awesome. It is so beyond our understanding. You are worthy of our praise. You are worthy of communion every single day as we acknowledge what the wafer represents. Oh, your body. The body that you took on in this realm. You took on everything. Every stripe is for our healing. We are healed. We are whole. We access that by faith. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And before I even go further, let us take this wafer that represents the body that was bruised, that was beaten, that was tortured. That we might find healing. What a payment. What a payment. Thank you, Jesus, your love. 
There's no greater love than a man lay down his life for another. Thank you, Jesus, that you became a man. You became a human to show us the way, the way it can be with dependence on the Father, walking, led by the Holy Spirit. Thank you. We take this wafer as a renewal of the covenant as believers with you. We receive it with grateful, grateful hearts. Take it up. God, you are so holy. I thank you for your mighty power. I thank you for your power that the blood of Jesus paid for to wash away our sin, to conquer death and hell, purge us forever. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And it is because of the precious blood. Thank you. Thank you that this juice represents the blood of Jesus. Take it up. We renew our covenant with you. Receive it in Jesus' name. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. Thank you, God. Let us never take lightly these songs that we sing, giving you the honor and the glory. I thank you, God. I've seen hell quake with my own eyes at what the blood of Jesus represents, what the sacrifice, what the payment on the cross represents. God, I pray today in the name of Jesus, that you would give us a deeper revelation that what you paid for, let us not diminish it and demean it by reducing it to some ticket-holding status. It is so much more than that. It is eternal life and power and victory and conquering right now when we receive it. Thank you. God, we worship you, we praise you, and I pray that you would open our eyes to see that what we carry in Christ Jesus because of the blood and the body that was given for us on the cross and that did not stay there, that rose again, conquering everything, death and hell, nothing was limited because you paid it all. God, give us that revelation that we will not walk in defeat or even be back on our heels with intimidation when the screaming of the enemy gets, seems like it's a little bit louder. Let your voice always be the loudest voice we hear. God, keep, as Wendy mentioned this morning in class, keep a signal, our signal completely in tune with you. Let us always be aware if our signal goes dim, for we will not hear what you're saying. We must stay connected with the intentionality of our yes every single day. That is the act of worship, seeking you every day. First, the kingdom of God, your righteousness, and then you will add everything else. Breakthrough, victory, Help, hope, joy, and love. God, I pray, continue to receive our worship as we worship the next couple of songs with the team. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.
Start over. Let's start over. Okay. One, two, three, four. Thank you, Lord. To be loved is to be loved by. 